Hello, this is the final video in my series on behaviorism, this one dealing with the paradigm shift to cognitive science which occurred in the 1960s. The behaviorist paradigm dominated American psychology from the 1920s through to the 1960s. During this behaviorist era, researchers in fields ignored by behaviorism including perception, motivation, personality, and child development, together with those such as the Gestaltists, who made quite different theoretical assumptions, continued to work. The limitations of behaviorism became increasingly obvious, however. Particular problems, including the recognition of the importance of thinking, meaningfulness, and species-specific behavior. One of the first major problems to arise with the behaviorist model had been the question of cognitive processes. As we have seen with the work of Tolman in particular, a primary reason for the emergence of neo-behaviorism was the inadequacy of purely behaviorist accounts of behavior. Rats, as also humans, kept behaving as if some internal process, thinking, was occurring. Over and again, experimental animals acted in ways that didn't fit neatly into rate of response curves. A rat might press a bar with extra force over and again after food pellet rewards had ceased and extinction of the behavior was expected. In a somewhat analogous fashion, of course, humans might respond angrily to a malfunctioning vending machine, pulling the lever harder after it didn't deliver or even hitting the machine. Again, the work of Gestaltist psychologists in areas such as memory research confounded behaviorist expectations. For the behaviorists, human memory was expected to operate according to precise and ultimately purely mathematical terms, with memory expected to become stronger with more trials and reinforcements, and complex memories, such as phone numbers, being built up by associative links, one number followed by another. But in reality, memory was clearly linked to meaningfulness and could be strengthened by rearranging the elements to be remembered into patterns, as with the system of grouping or chunking, often employed in memorizing telephone numbers and their area codes. Again, some things, such as identity numbers, could only be remembered with great difficulty despite frequent repetition, whilst others, such as the exorbitant price of a dinner in a particular restaurant, could be remembered with ease. The limitations of animal experiments also became increasingly apparent. All of the major behaviorist and proto-behaviorist thinkers are remembered for the important experiments they performed on animals. Underlying this practice, of course, was the belief that the laws and principles of behavior were the same for all sentient creatures, and therefore what one learned from chickens, cats, dogs, and rats, other species, could be applied to humans. As behaviorist research accumulated, however, it became increasingly obvious to most researchers that this was not the case. Skinner had said that all animals behaved in the same way in response to conditioning, but this was simply not true. Clearly, each species had its own built-in circuitry that made it easier to learn some things, but difficult or impossible to learn others. For example, pigeons could be trained to peck at a disc for food, but they couldn't be trained to flap their wings for the same reward. Rats could be easily trained to press a bar for food, but cats only with great difficulty. A rat given sour blue water to drink, followed by a nauseating drug, would thereafter shun sour water, but willingly drink blue water, whereas a quail, given the same treatment, would shun blue water but drink sour water. That is, the rat was sensitive to the taste, the quail to the color. The detailed actualities of learning were not universally applicable. Crudely, rat psychology was not necessarily human psychology. Again, outside of psychology, other disciplines were casting new light on the workings of the mind. These included anthropologists studying the way in which preliterate peoples thought, psycholinguistic accounts of how humans acquired and used language, and computer science conceptions of thinking as information processing 
similar to the step-by-step -step working of a computer. Meanwhile, in the German intellectual tradition, the science of ethology began to emerge, eventually becoming the dominant perspective in the scientific understanding of animal behavior from the 1960s onwards. As new psychological data accumulated, the reigning behaviorist paradigm was increasingly shown to be unable to answer important questions, and an increasing number of American psychologists became aware of developments outside of their field. This created a situation of uncertainty, which in Kuhnian fashion led to a paradigm shift which occurred during the 1960s. As you remember, Thomas Kuhn proposed that intellectual paradigms change when an existing framework of knowledge no longer adequately fits the data. This shift was characterized in the present instance by both a knowledge explosion and a new conception of psychology. Central to the new paradigm was cognitive science, a mind-based science relying on experimental methods to make reasonable inferences about mental processes. It comprised an aggregation of specialties. This passing of the behaviorist era did not lead to the abandonment of the results of behaviorist research, but rather their overshadowing by new ideas. It was the theoretical model of behaviorism as an overarching framework for explaining human and animal behavior which was discarded as inadequate. Specific behaviorist findings were simply absorbed into the new model. Thank you for listening. The next set of videos will deal with the Gestaltist paradigm that provided the most sustained challenge to behaviorism during its heyday and was an important element in the newly developing framework of cognitive science.